I'm Ari Melber, and joining us now is Academy Award nominee, Emmy and Golden Globe winning actor and producer, Sharon Stone. Thanks for being Hi, here. Ari. You uh, have this new memoir. In your core, you write that you felt like you started out introverted. How did that work for you in fields that are so much about presentation? Well, I think I'm still personally a very shy person and an introverted person, but I have, um, as a professional, my job is to um, be quite empathetic uh, about others. And I think part of my introversion has allowed me to really study other people and to observe other people quite well. I love to watch people and the habitual way they do things. Um, so I think a lot of shy people are actually in my field and some of the greatest. I mean, I had the great, um, great honor of working with Robert De Niro, who's one of the finest actors and he's probably one of the most shy people I've ever met in my life. So I think it's not uncommon to be particularly introverted and do the job that I do um, because you're not really around a lot of people when you're doing it. You're only around them at the premiere, really, and things like that. So it seems like you're more extroverted than you actually are. Well, many of the characters seem extroverted, no? Well, yes, because I, I have played a lot of antisocial characters who are without regard for others. A lot of antisocial characters. Uh, that's an interesting way to put it. Let's look at just a couple of them. I'd have to be pretty stupid to write a book about killing and then kill somebody the way I described it in my book. I'd be announcing myself as the killer. I'm not stupid. You're not fast enough for me! Today I am. <laughs> well, let's come back to town. How would it look for a married woman to move in with her parents apart from her husband? What did you do to make him angry? You look like a woman who knows her way around the world. I think we have that in common. Do you start fresh every time, or is there a thread here? Oh, no. Every character is uh, certainly a completely new being, a completely separate and unique being. So do you have a favorite style? Because I have other clips. We'll get into how you ended up. <laughs> but. Did you find that the career drew you to these certain characters because that's where opportunities were, or actually you like doing that? Um, well, I really did want the part in Basic Instinct. I really wanted that part because I was so fascinated by playing this person who was so complicated, but appeared so simple smooth, serene. Um, she appeared as smooth as those white scarves that she threw around. And I liked that underneath all that was this incredibly complicated, broken uh, sociopath. And I, I liked the work that I did to prepare for that part. I watched a lot of uh, film of serial killers um, there was, uh, there were, there were documentary film interviews of serial killers in prison describing their, uh, crimes. There were some docudramas made of f film footage of serial killers and then actors acting out their crimes and the serial killers explaining why they needed to stay in prison. What was the drive? I also read William Styron's Darkness Visible, which was the, uh, his self, you know, annotated uh, story about his own nervous breakdown, which was fascinating. And so, and I read things like all of the different versions of Joan of Arc, because there were just different ideas about this person that thought that she was doing this wonderful, so, savior, this was the salvation. And I think that these uh, sociopathic characters really do believe they are saving and doing the right thing. So it was this great way to sort of combine these weird, um, I hesitate to call them qualities, but these distinctive characteristics. So I, I really liked um, 
breaking down what to me is like almost like the science of a character. When I did Casino, <clears throat> the director, Marty Scorsese, got me all of the FBI files on the character that I played because she was a real life character. And that was just absolutely fascinating because I got to read all these files. I had tons of pictures. I had video. And then once I attained the part, um, many of her former friends and associates in Las Vegas started contacting me and telling me I could meet them like one o'clock in the morning on the corner of this street and that street. And I started meeting all these people. And even one of the people that I met was a person who still had to have a bodyguard in their house, walking room to room with them. Oh. So there were many fascinating aspects of building that character. So it just depends on the character I'm building and what's available for reference points, how I work on a character. You write in the book that the screen test uh, for Basic Instinct is still available online. People mm -hmm. want to see it. Yeah. You kill Mr. Buck. I'd have to be pretty stupid to write a book about killing somebody and then kill them the way I described it in the book. I'd be announcing myself as the killer. I'm not stupid. It feels like the character was quite fully formed in the screen test. Was yes. that specific to that character, or do you often find that you're ready to go? In that particular case, I tested for eight months. So by the time I tested with Michael Douglas, I was good to go. And I have a, a simple, maybe even dumb question for you, but... I doubt you have dumb questions, are All you? questions can go somewhere. You look at the arc of your life, which you write about. Did a lot of people just have a problem separating your character in that film from you? Because don't we know that your whole job as an actor is to become a different character, and yet they thought it was you to some degree? I, part of that was my fault. Um, after I did the movie, and before it was released, which because it's kind of a long time sometimes between completing a film and their release, my um, publicist, who was fabulous, had gotten me the cover of the Rolling Stone in the What's Hot cover, which is a very big get. And so it was like, now what? Now what are we going to do? Because I have to go out and publicize this movie. And as you said, you know, this is kind of this shy person who now has to figure out how to be in public. So what are we going to do? And Cindy was like, you know, how are you going to do this? You know, how do you want to approach this? Now, this isn't now where you can just go out and be whoever you want to be. You know, Billie Eilish can have green hair. You know, you could shave your head. You can be... Lately, Billie Eilish <clears throat> is going more Sharon Stone, by the way. She's looking pretty hot, I have to say. Her Vogue cover was amazing. But you can be what you want to be. You know, we're so much more accepting now. But this is 30 years ago. And so my publicist said, you know, you have to pick your public persona. And... Like another role. Yes. And I was like, oh... She said, because if you're kind of like goody goody and stay home and read all the time, you know, they'll see you kissing someone and that will be a problem. But isn't that exhausting? Because then that means you have to act when you're not on set? Exactly. So you have to form like a public publicity persona. And I thought that was kind of a fun, good idea for me. Um, so that I wasn't just going to cry when people <laughs> interviewed me. So I got kind of sassy and funny and and it was easier because what happened is people would see the film and then immediately come in a room and be like this, knee to knee interviewing me and they were scared of me because they just saw the movie. Well, you did kill a lot of people. And yeah, of course. I just ice picked them left and right. So they came in and they looked at me and I was like, oh, they're scared of me. And that was kind of funny to me. So how long did you do that for? Up really, like, until not that long ago. Really? <laughs> yeah. Like, into your 50s? Into my 50s. So what, even post-stroke, so what changed you from that approach? I got really tired of everybody else telling me who I was. I got tired of being forced into a sort of, you can't play this, and no one will believe you as that, and it's going to be like this, and you're now too old to do this, and you can't be that. And I was just like, you know... I couldn't even carry the weight of it, you know, and being punished for playing a character that was so dissimilar from me 
that I had nightmares playing it. I just didn't, it just was also too stupid for me. The whole thing just got way too stupid for me. And I was just, you know, like enough is enough. Mm. As you say, it changed your life and it had international reaction. Yeah. I want to read from something we dug up. This is the New York Times in 1994. Mm -hmm. Sharon Stone is one of the top two female stars in Hollywood, along with Julia Roberts, who plays victims in need of rescue by men, while Miss Stone, by contrast, is at her best portraying strong, capable women. Do you remember what that article was headlined? I don't. The ultimate question, can Sharon Stone act? Why do you think in a time when you were factually being recognized for playing strong characters, in contrast to what Hollywood wanted, there was still this enduring public or critical questioning of your talent? Because I think misogyny is strong and is still incredibly strong. And I think if you portray strength, it's easier to say that you, there's something wrong with you. Um, and if you're strong, and if you're smart, and if you have boundaries, there must be something wrong with you. It couldn't possibly be that you're just self-possessed female who has both feet on the ground. And if we, we as a society, have that problem, the, the, the misogyny and those blinders, even in culture, yes, which is what we choose. People can choose to see your film or not. Right. How do you think that plays out in the way we deal with women in power, in government, in reality? Well, I think, you know, we see this very strongly even, and I have to say, even with Liz Cheney, who, let's say, I don't agree with all of her views, but I certainly agree with her, uh, with her right and ability to have them, and I thought she had them quite well. But we're trying to, um, I don't know how to explain it. It's almost like McCarthyism all over again. It's like there is just such an insistence that we have a common opinion about this and a common opinion about that. And if you don't, see you later. And it's just not okay. It's not okay for us to be like that. Mm. That's not what America is for. It's not what this country, this beautiful, proud country was formed for. It was formed against that. That was the very point of this country, is that that's what this country will not do. And so I don't believe in that. I am very intolerant of that. I feel that every time we do that, it's against what this country is about. That is not democracy. And in the book, you write about the difference between the critical reception of the times, uh, which in many cases just doesn't endure very well. It doesn't look all that great in the rear view. It doesn't look good in the rear view and it doesn't look good right out the windshield. <laughs> uh, and so you have this great line I want to read to you where you say, a critic sees movies for free and tells you what they think. An audience tells you how a movie makes them feel. Yes. And I have to tell you, when I was reading this, you know, we, we look to the wisdom of lyrics sometimes around here <laughs> and you write songs yourself. Uh -huh. Oh, oh What do you got? You got something? I know how much you like rap. <laughs> if you could you a, you give me a, a little beatbox me in, I have a little rap here for you. You have a rap. I'll tell you what I'll try to do. Because uh, I don't know how to beatbox, and I wouldn't claim to. But this is like a... I'm on the air with Ari. Heart beating like a Ferrari. I could have been a zooming, <laughs> but I wanted to be in the rooming. I wanted to be able to lean in and kiss ya. I didn't want to miss ya. Who'd want to miss that? <laughs> Let's see, how can I say this in the most <laughs> professional way possible? <laughs> there are many people who dream to have this experience with you, so I'm happy you're sharing it with us. You know. <laughs> How many songs have you written? Me, I've written like a, a couple hundred songs. Yeah, and lately they've found their audience too. Well, I started, <laughs> I started doing like beat, beat poetry, and I used to do beat poetry in a cafe with a couple of friends, and then they were like, oh no, you, you're a songwriter. Write a song, write it today. So I wrote a song and they took it to Jennifer Warren's and she sang it. 
And then um, I started writing songs and I had my first number one hit in Germany, a song I wrote for my son. It's uh, very beautiful with an artist called Togs. And I wrote this song called For You. It's really beautiful. And then I wrote a song in Sweden with a guy named Jorgen Olofsson who writes a lot of hits uh, for Nashville people. And then I wrote a song with a guy named Beto Cuervo who's a big uh, pop star in South America. And we wrote a song for a Nobel laureate who was uh, murdered, a poet, a, a Nobel poet. Um, and that became on a number, a number one album in South America. And then I thought, I should really start trying to do it here. I mean, I did write the lyrics for Come Together Now for the Katrina album. As a fan of music, a lot of really great musical performers seem to overlap with some acting skills. We've seen them go both ways. You see someone like LL Cool J, who had a great oh, persona, right. go towards you. You've seen right. Marky Mark go towards you, but you've also right. seen people like Drake Right. come out of a professional on-screen acting first. Absolutely. And now a global pop star. Right. There seems to be, I don't know what the words are, but there seems to be something going on. Kind of on confluence there. For you guys, yeah. Well, I mean, I went to uh, college on a writing scholarship when I was a kid. So I've always been writing. Um, and I just write all the time. I mean, I write on the back of napkins and, you know, matchbook covers and anything, you know, that's laying around. And I've just always written poetry and short stories and, um, and these lyrics. The line I was thinking of that <laughs> echoes from your book is, if you know Method Man from Wu-Tang, yeah. uh, he says, with regard to critics, for him it's music critics, for you I right. read some of the dated criticism of, yeah. of your time. He says, F a rap critic, he talk about it while I live it. That's really it. I mean, you know, it's like people say to me, you know, when was the last time you watched whatever? And I'm like, I don't really watch them. I, I'm, I live them. Right. You know, I was there. It's like I don't really need to go back and look at it because I was actually on the inside yeah. of it. And yet in your world and ours, prestige still matters to most people. It's still factored in. Uh, and the critics and the awards figure in somehow. Uh, it seemed meaningful to you when you got, by many accounts, the well-deserved Golden Globe for Casino. Uh, I, I wanna... was so shocked. Well, you looked a little surprised. Let's, <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna relive that moment for you. When's the last time you may have seen those awards? I never saw it. Okay. And the winner is Sharon Stone for Casino. And no one is more surprised than me. It's, okay, it's a miracle. <laughs> Thank you to the Foreign Press Association. <laughs> for your support to me tonight and for the 19 years I've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> I have to thank Marty Scorsese for touching me with his incredible genius and making room for the breadth and annoying moments of my uncontrollable passion for this part. What did it mean to you? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> oh, it's so touching to see that. Um, it meant everything to me. I mean, I, um, that's so touching. Oh my God. That's so funny. Uh, he asked what, what me. What makes you tearful about it now? Look, I'm a kid from nowhere. You know, I grew up in a farming community. I mean, there were 87 kids in my school class you know what I mean like it was like really one stoplight town and I had a very big dream that grew up from watching black and white movies on a TV that had three channels on good days you know and bunny ears on the top but you'd already made it in every measurable way there was something else about your peers or whatever you call that saying you're also really good at it well I never thought they anyone would pick. I'm not the person people pick. You know, I'm like the very, I'm like the dark of darkest horses, you know? And so I went and I told Vera Wang, my, my friend, um, thank you, Ari, thank you. I told her like, just make me a dress that makes me look like I just jumped out of the swimming pool, please, and came over. Like, I don't want to look like 
a big loser in a big puffy dress, you know? And I was talking to um, Dr. George Miller, who directed uh, that movie Babe about the pig uh -huh. that I thought was so fantastic. And I was fascinated by that whole idea. And so I was very engrossed in a conversation with him when my friend Nadia Bronson, who's now passed away, is my dear friend, started hitting me. And she said, it's you, it's you, it's you. And I said, it's me what? And she said, you won. And I, I, it was just so inconceivable to me that I hadn't even been listening. I didn't, I was like, la, 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 la. I, you were projecting ahead and the industry, of course, makes you dress for what you think is going to happen and all that. But you were projecting ahead to the moment when you would be the dignified loser, loser of that contest. And I wouldn't have to like go through that horrible feeling. And I was just like, la, la, la. And so when I won, I, I was like, oh my God. So I was already a beat behind. So I got up and I started up the stairs and I kind of didn't know what was going on. And Tom Hanks grabbed me by the arms and he went, you deserve this. And they want a good show. Don't cry. And I went, oh, He right. said, don't cry? Yeah. Why? And Because they, they want a good show. Like, you deserve this. Like, go get it. And I was like, oh, OK. Because I think he knew I was just going to crumble. Like, I, I was like so. Like Tom Hanks always knows. He does. He does. He does in all the ways. But you still took the shot once you were up there and said it was overdue. Well, yeah, because it was like funny. You know, it was just <laughs> funny. Like, it was funny. I remember Steve Martin was sitting in the front and he was really laughing and I thought, oh, that's good. Yeah. At least people are laughing. Yeah. My final clip for you is the range, we, you have these darker characters, and then you have this other range. Here's a very funny scene from a funny movie you did with Albert Brooks, uh, The Muse. What, what, what's wrong? I don't like the room service here. Oh, how could that be? You're at the Four Seasons. Yeah, I want a Waldorf salad. <laughs> so, order one. <laughs> but they won't make it after 10. All right, calm down, take it easy. <laughs> Maybe we made a mistake. What? Maybe you and I shouldn't work together. Why? Because I'm questioning your order? Just make sure they don't put any cheese on it. Are you writing this down? Yes, I'm always writing it down. No. Cheese. How'd you like doing comedy? Well, there's two questions in that. How do I like doing comedy and how do I like doing comedy with Albert Brooks? I mean, I like doing comedy more than I like doing anything else. I'd rather do comedies for the rest of my life because I think everything's funny. Um, but then there's how do you like doing comedy with the king of comedy? Because Albert Brooks is the funniest person alive. I mean, just going to work with Albert Brooks, he's like that all day. He's not just like that when they say action. You know, some people are funny when it's time to be funny. But Albert is like Robin Williams was. I mean, Robin was my neighbor in San Francisco. Um, so, but Albert's funny all day long and it's just fun to be around Albert. It's fun to work with him. It's fun to learn from his incredible, his way of being is timing. His timing is just fabulous. He's so good. He's so smart. He's so clever. Does it matter to you to show that range or you can't control what you're known for so if people know you for three out of a hundred movies so be it better than right none. right it's hard it's hard it's also hard in the system of Hollywood because I think that people don't really understand I think they think that the offers come in for you and then your agents give them to you I think that they don't understand that the offers come into the agency and then the agents have a meeting and then they think who would those offers be really good for? And that they don't necessarily come to you. And you write about a type of meanness that people might not know about. People going out of their way to tell you, you were 10th or 12th for this spot. <laughs> yeah, and when I got Basic Instinct, yes, the line producer called me into his office the day I signed my contract to sit me down and have a little talk with me and tell me, Karen, you are our 13th choice for this film. And you write that Hollywood likes hungry, or as people would say today, thirsty. Yeah. Why, why? 
Because I think that if you feel desperate, you're easier to control. And because you are the product, it's not something they can take home, put in the safe, it, does what, it doesn't do anything weird, and then they can bring back and it's okay. So it's an effort to make sure they've got a handle on it so nothing goes crazy because films cost a lot. They can cost four million or they can cost 50 million or they can cost a hundred million. And if you're the key element, what happens if you go haywire? So whatever they think is the controlling element so that you don't go haywire or so that they've got a grip on you. And unfortunately, many people think that a negative approach is the more controlling approach. I frankly don't, and in my opinion, the people who are really good at it, like Marty Scorsese, like Albert Brooks, the people with whom I've worked with so well and so compatibly, don't think that negativity is a way to do it. They think positivity is a way to do it. And helping you and encouraging you and teaching you and showing you and far be it from me to say if it's genuine, but loving you is a way to help you be your best. And you write about that, control, gender, sexism. Uh, I have another passage from the book. I could read it, or, or you could. What do you prefer? It's about your discussion of rage. I know that I'm not alone in processing some pent-up female rage. It's unnerving to know that form, this rage, was so controlled. I think because I was forced to control it for so long, to keep it hidden as though it were my shame. This was the nature of abuse in my era. Everything carried the weight of threat. You also write historically about men that you say have crossed lines professionally uh, or engage in some kind of misconduct. And you write that you had the idea that in your view, <laughs> yes. uh, it could be constructive to, to offer them the chance to discuss it privately right? as a, as a different way that you thought might be worthwhile. Uh, how many of them took you up on that? None. So tell Nobody. me about that. Nobody. <laughs> My idea about truth and reconciliation in the format of sexual abuse is something that in my small way, I thought maybe could happen. That maybe if I approached people who had been abusive to me, but had not crossed a line where you could say this is a felony, where they hadn't um, physically assaulted me and hadn't been physically violent with me, but had oppressed me in the workplace and disallowed me from being professional in my workplace that maybe I would be able to have this sort of conversation with them and that I would be able to create where they would be able to unburden their behavior and I would be able to try to understand and that through that I would be able to grow and understand why people behave this way and I would be able to start working on this conflict. The way you write it is that it was almost a potential middle ground, you, as you say, in the spirit of reconciliation, meet, willing to meet in the middle. That's what, yes. But these men, you write, wouldn't meet you there. No, and they, they were very much like, I would say, you did this. It made it just implausible for me to be able to work and work successfully. It became just completely untenable. Um, I would really like to talk it out with you. And they would say, if you think that I've done something, tell me what it is. I just told you what it was, and oh, I don't. I don't recall that, you know. And and I feel that because we have so many lawsuits that lawyers tell people you can't even apologize because that that admits that you've done something wrong. Nobody apologizes for anything anymore. No one can remember to say those two most incredible words that we all long to hear: "I'm sorry." I'm sorry goes a long friggin' way with me. I am so sorry. You know, this is what was happening with me. I should have never done that. But I do feel that there is potential for this, that there is potential to work through some of this stuff. That brings me to the final basic instinct question. And in our research, we found 
you've been asked about this for decades, so. I think all the answers are in the book. Exactly. So, so we I, probably don't even need to start. <laughs> the question I Let's have. Let's not go there. Well, the only question about the, that you mentioned in the book is, as you describe in the book, you hadn't been given full knowledge for that famous scene. My only question after reading the book's discussion of it, which people can read for themselves, is does or should that change how people understand the art or not? There's a real difference between art and commerce, okay? When I got the part, I was wholly willing to play this character. And I realized that she used her body and her sexuality to be manipulative and to be a killer. And so I was willing to be totally naked and to be filmed naked to play the part. However, this was 30 years ago, and there was a SAG structure of what could be shown on film and get an R rating. And this was Michael Douglas, and this was Paramount, and this was meant to be an R film. So I was guaranteed by that structure of what kind of film we would make and what could, should, and would not be seen in an R film. So I went in with a certain comfort zone of what, even though I would have to walk around completely naked, what could and would be seen by the public. So, of course, you can imagine my chagrin when something went over that line. It's because I had a certain guarantee by my union and by the rules of our industry what could and could not happen. So that's where the line happened. Now that they're releasing the 30 year anniversary release and my director had made a European director's cut that was a triple X that he released in some art house in Europe and now they're releasing that triple X director's cut and because SAG didn't protect actresses like me from that kind of thing until after that time, I'm not protected now. So they can release that film and they're planning on it with no knowledge or consent from me and no payment or anything to me. And so once again, I get to be traumatized all over again 30 years later without my input, knowledge or consent. So yes, the industry can to me because the rules change and the line moves. And so people ask me, what's the one thing you should know about Hollywood? The bottom line has a trap door. Well put and very logically put and folks can read the entire discussion in the book. It's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, in closing, I'd love to do something with you we've done with other people, which is a kind of a lightning round. Okay. So it's fast answers. Good. Like I was really good at Jeopardy. <laughs> it's like that. In a word or a sentence, some, some roles. Okay. Catherine Chamel. Hot and sassy. Ginger McKenna. Loved by her children. From the quick and the dead, uh, the lady. I was the fastest quick draw in America. The prosecutor, uh, Sheila Carlisle. Oh. I love working with James Spader. Who wouldn't? All right, this is one word or a sentence, actual people. Michael Douglas. Fabulous, uh, amazing humanitarian. His um, precognition of what we need to know and see is like no other artist working. Arnold Schwarzenegger. He taught me more about doing PR than anybody else in the business. He PR'd his way to the uh, governor's mansion. That's right. Uh, Robert De Niro. My greatest screen love. Martin Scorsese. King of directors. Someone you've also spent time with, uh, given your work on HIV AIDS, which many people know about, Dr. Fauci. Oh, we are so lucky to have Tony Fauci on this planet. He is a great human being, a great scientist, a great humanitarian, and he always tells the truth. He has been so patient that he made it through the Trump administration with his sanity is extraordinary to me, and we should trust him and believe in him, and I am so grateful to know him and work with him. 
And while he's been busy working on COVID, he worked to end sleeping sickness all over the globe. Polio is finally ended all over the globe. Um, he just keeps ending all these other infectious diseases all over the world. And it is my pleasure and privilege to continue to work with him on all those things. I just, I, 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 I can't say enough good about him. Kamala Harris. Ah. Oh. I'm in her poker game. Yeah? Yeah. What's that like? I can't say. <laughs> uh, Nancy Pelosi. You know, I've known Nancy Pelosi for so long. And Nancy is such a right-minded person and such a good person. And I have to say. All right. Uh, Favorite role you've ever played? Mom. Least favorite? Divorcee. Well, who's your favorite rap artist or hip hop artist? Currently or ever? Probably ever, I'm curious. Oh, Biggie Smalls. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because I loved the way he used the uh, orchestra and that he really understood rap as a full musical construct. And I love the way that it was the, really the poetry of the streets and that it was a, it's a sophisticated kind of art form. And this is a final, final two. In a, in a word or a sentence for you, 2020. Clarity. 2021. Putting that clarity into action. I like, I like both of those. Uh, Sharon Stone, thank you for spending time with us today. Ari. I have always wanted to meet you. I am so honored that you did this and in person so that we could meet each other. It's better in person. I, what isn't? I learned more about you uh, preparing and talking to you today and I really loved it. So thank you thank again. Thank you, me too, thank you.